Okay, paleopedology. This time, parent material. So parent material is a starting point, basically, for the soil itself. And for any really detailed accounting of the degree of soil formation that's gone on, what you really need to know is what was there before? What was there at the start? Um, there are um, a number of features of uh, parent material that are worth considering when you're trying to interpret a modern soil or a paleosol. The problem is just as bad for a modern soil as it is for a paleosol because, of course, the parent material is no longer there. It's a soil now, uh, and you have to kind of infer what was there in the past. Uh, one way to look at it is that if um, soil were a commercial product, and of course it is, um, you can buy soil for your garden, um, the ideal parent material would be uh, a material that was closest to soil in its various properties. That would take the least effort to turn into uh, a soil. Um, the various properties of this parent material uh, what we're going to consider uh, now. Now, one of these properties um, of soil, um, which is um, really desirable in a good garden soil or uh, agricultural soil, is um, uniformity. Uh, soils are a relatively homo homogeneous um, material. Uh, for example, if you have an alluvial point bar cycle, which has um, gravel going to um, the um, uh, these layers of a, a levee, and then a, um, a soil like this um, there's the there's the soil here's another soil here's another soil um, here's um, a, um, a, a paleo channel here's a paleo soil down um, in here uh, this is clay 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 sandy 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 gravelly gravelly clay 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 um, this is actually quite a um, heterogeneous material. Um, it has um, different layers of sand and shale um, alternating uh, to turn this whole thing into a uh, into a soil, including maybe an, 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 a little bit of a um, flood deposit on the very top, uh, which is introduced by uh, by a recent flood. Um, basically what is happening uh, is that the whole thing becomes haploidized. Now, you're not going to change the material down here all that much, but this um, is being mixed up by um, individual, um, individual roots uh, and also uh, by a whole variety of um, different um, salt organisms um, and um, shrinkage cracks and other um, soil forming features uh, that are mixing it into a uniform uh, material, um, which is uh, what plants and animals do to an original uh, parent material. Uh, this is a non-uniform parent, but it ends up looking pretty uh, uniform. So how can you actually uh, tell whether it was like this or whether it maybe was just a graded bed in 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 the first place? Uh, similarly, we have a, we have a real problem too. Um, here's some trees. Um, if we're looking at a soil um, on a a granite, for example, we'll we'll, we'll put in our pegmatite dike like I talked about last time, which is uh, going. Um, in a, in a curve into uh, soil creep. We've got a granite here. Um, it's definitely a soil profile here. Uh, and then we have a, um, a soil on top 
um, was that soil developed from the granite? Did it start out as rock and then it became clay at the very top? Or was it a situation um, where the um, the soil on top was developed on sediment on top of uh, the soil? Um, we can tell in this case from um, the pegmatite um, being disrupted like so uh, and these are the core stones um, here we go down to the um, granite at the base um, so that this <clears throat> these alternatives this is what you want to this is what you want to find out the, the whole thing is going to look pretty seamless in the end because of soil formation especially over a long period of time but were there were there <coughs> discontinuities in this um, in this material? How do you choose between these two um, alternatives? Well, number one, mineral anomalies. Anomalies. Um, if this were the case, um, you would expect that there might be quartz stringers here. And you might only see them when you may, when you do a thin section. They might be, not be apparent in a hand specimen, but you may see um, particular um, stringers of uh, material. Uh, in this particular case, you may find um, in here um, that there are minerals uh, that don't occur in a granite. For example, um, pyroxene or olivine, that would be pretty rare, or some strange um, uh, metamorphic mineral like storolite or kyanite. Um, a mineral that didn't didn't really belong in the granite, um, or didn't really belong in the um, in the in the parent material. Uh, in the case of quartz, of course, it's just a, a grain size thing, and what was once a quartz bed has now become mixed in to some extent. But the quartz grains are still going to be there, most of them, uh, just displaced and homogenized in um, grain size anomalies. Um, you can look at the um, individual um, grain sizes of um, the uh, grains here and here. If there are lots of sand grains here, lots of sand grains here um, um, in this part, and not too much sand grain up here, then this um, subsequent um, formation of a sediment and then the development of a soil on that is more, uh, is more likely. We can look at chemical anomalies. And the elements that really are telling are zirconium, or zircon, zirconium, uh, and titanium. Uh, these are two elements that are relatively stable in soil, so they don't tend to move. Um, if we find that um, if we if we find that there's a kind of a curve of uh, TiO2. Um, that looks kind of like this with spikes, um, then that would indicate that there were once um, individual beds of material that had um, maybe um, the opaque heavy mineral uh, ilmenite, uh, which has uh, titanium um, in it. Stone lines. Stone lines are a great indication, and that's what I've drawn here. Um, where we can see the um, formation of a, of, a, of a desert pavement or uh, an alluvial um, incision surface within a soil itself. If we have a, a trail of um, gravel, of boulders, even if they're, they're scattered apart, that suggests that um, this was eroded back to this level. There was some uh, pebbles sitting on the surface and then there was subsequent sedimentation. If we don't have a stone line, then we may um, assume that it was probably a more continuous um, profile. Stone lines are actually quite common in really deep um, soils uh, that are on bedrock situations, um, like on a granite, uh, for example. Um, and they have a very um, distinctive uh, look. Uh, sharp contacts. Sedimentary contacts tend to be sharp, like here, here, and here. Whereas um, 
horizons tend to be graded. Um, we may have an A, an E, a BT, a C. Um, they tend to be graded, whereas sedimentary contacts tend to be relatively sharp. And if we see um, some uh, sort of a, um, uh, a sharp contact as opposed to the normal sort of gradation that we find um, in um, uh, in uh, in uh, in the soil, uh, we might suspect that there's some sort of bedding um, irregularity. And then finally, um, unusual horizon sequences. And these will generally manifest themselves as sharp contacts as well. Um, for example, you might have a, have a profile that had an E, a BT, another E. E horizon, BT, E horizon, uh, with, with, even with root traces. Um, these are indications that there's some sort of discontinuity um, there. Uh, generally speaking, the horizons, as you know, uh, are going to proceed A, B, um, C down um, down the profile. So uniformity uniformity of, of parent material is um, something that you need to be aware of because it can make a difference uh, to how you interpret the soil. Whether it is one soil, in this case two, um, in this case it's also two. There's a soil under here. Uh, that may have been somewhat truncated in another soil up here um, at the modern at the modern land surface. Uh, in duration, soil parent materials that are hard are going to form very different sorts of soils than uh, soil parent materials that are soft. Um, and um, in limestone, for example, um, we uh, can see two different sorts of of, of paleosols. Uh, one of them uh, is a paleocast. This is limestone. Uh, in a paleocast, um, the limestone is hard and soil formation uh, forms by dissolution uh, down the cracks of um, the soil uh, and the dissolution of the limestone and oxidation of minerals within the limestone uh, to form what is called a terra rosa, a, a red soil, a very red soil, which is forming um, this very distinctive uh, crack pattern. But if you have a limestone that was originally just a very calcareous uh, sand, um, that will form a very different kind of a soil. This would be a cement um, with nodules, um, with root traces penetrating through it, maybe with a little bit of reddening up in here, um, and with calcareous rhizoconcretions. which we saw in the first lab. Um, this is a nodule of uh, carbonate that is forming in this soil. Um, it's an uninjurated, it was a loose calcareous sand parent material as opposed to a hard limestone bedrock parent material. The plants could easily penetrate it. They formed these calcareous rise accretions and, and nodules. Um, a very different sort of parent material um, creates a very different sort of soil. Um, these take a long time to dissolve out. The roots are actually going down the cracks. They're dissolving out the limestone in this, uh, this characteristic paleocast pattern. Um, in this case, the roots are just penetrating down through a relatively loose sand. Um, and because it's so calcareous, um, they're creating um, rhizoconcretions. So parent materials, um, whether they're uh, indurated or soft, and create very different sorts of um, soil profiles. Grain size. <clears throat>
grain size of a parent material affects the degree of uh, soil formation um, because uh, it uh, determines uh, how easily it is for weathering uh, solutions uh, to get to um, the weatherable minerals in the profile uh, itself. Now um, this is very very clear um, in uh, tills um, around the world. Um, uh, there have been some lovely um, studies done uh, for example in the tills of the Sierra Nevada uh, and uh, a till of course is a very poorly mixed uh, rock which has um, lots of different kinds of rock um, in it. Uh, in the Sierra Nevada uh, you can have granite Um, you can have basalt, um, and you can have andesite. Um, granites um, in the soil tend to form a kind of a loose um, material. This is called a grus. This is a boulder now in a soil in the Sierra Nevada um, east slope at a fairly low elevation in the desert. Uh, basalts tend to have a weathering line which is relatively um, thin, maybe a few millimeters. This is a weathering rind of oxidized material. Andesites have a weathering rind which is quite a bit wider. The reason is that the granite has very coarse grains, about a centimeter or so um, in size. And um, the weathering of a feldspar grain opens up quite a conduit for weathering solutions for water uh, and for carbon dioxide to get in there and uh, create a, um, more cavities. Um, granite tends to produce a, a rock which is just loose crystals. We call it grus. Um, the quartz is virtually unweathered. The feldspars are starting to disappear and getting very vuggy as they weather away uh, into a, um, a very deep weathering zone because the grain size is so coarse. At the other extreme, basalt is a very tight, fine-grained rock, and so the weathering solutions have difficulty getting into the interior. They um, weather only an outside uh, rind, and andesite is somewhat in between. Now these are all in the same soil. Um, so they all experience the same weathering regime, but clearly the, the degree and the depth of weathering in each of these individual rocks within a soil developed on till um, reflects the effect of grain size on the degree of uh, weathering. Crystallinity. Crystallinity is actually really important uh, for um, weathering uh, as well. Um, and that's because um, the crystal structure of minerals is more resistant than the non-crystal structure of minerals. So we're talking about crystals now versus glass. Um, a crystal of quartz, for example, um, if it's perfectly formed, uh, looks like this. It's a prismatic thing. Um, it's uh, it's uh, SiO2, um, and it is um, a relatively resistant material. Uh, to weathering because all of those um, individual compounds are linked in a tetrahedral three-dimensional structure which resists the intrusion of weathering hydrogen ions. Um, in the hydrolysis equation, remember, we get carbonic acid which introduces hydronium. That hydronium displaces cations to leave a residue of clay. In a glass, um, like a volcanic shard, for example, um, a super chilled piece of uh, volcanic glass, um, there is no crystal structure at all. Uh, when there is no crystal structure, uh, what it is is just a chilled compound. Um, and that compound has no clear uh, resistance to weathering uh, fluids. Glass weathers much more rapidly uh, than a crystal. These are virtually um, immortal. Uh, quartz does not weather very easily at all in soils. It's usually the thing that is left over. These, these can weather within 
um, just a, a few years or so. Mineralogy. Um, there's a very famous diagram uh, that was invented by uh, Golditch in um, 1938. Uh, he was actually a teacher at Northern Illinois University, uh, which was my first job in the United States. Um, and he was very interested in um, the degree to which different minerals um, can be easily or easily weathered or resist um, weathering. Um, and he uh, worked at the University of uh, Wisconsin at the time and couldn't afford a trip to the tropics. So he looked at paleosols um, in, in Wisconsin and Minnesota uh, below the, um, the Cretaceous marine uh, shales there. And he came up with this diagram here. There are basically two tracks, the soda feldspars and the calcium feldspars. Easily weathered. The sodium feldspar is the most easily weathered one because uh, sodium itself is easily dislodged from a crystal structure. A uh, calcium feldspar uh, less easily weathered, but all of these are actually um, pretty easily weathered uh, materials. Olivine, which doesn't have uh, a very rigid uh, structure, um, easily weathered, very easily weathered. You're hardly ever going to find olivine in a soil, in any soil. Pyroxene also. Um, very easily weathered. Easily weathered. Uh, whereas down here, we're going to get progressively more weather resistant. My type. Muscovite, K feldspar, potassium iron is large and has great ionic strength, very hard to dislodge uh, from the crystal structure, and then finally quartz down in here. Um, this is a, um, a very um, useful um, guide to degree of, um, of weathering. Uh, we can see uh, that um, these are, if a, if a soil is deeply weathered, it's going to have a lot of quartz in it and a lot of clay too, probably. Um, if it's not so weathered, it'll have um, a, a bit of feldspar and muscovite. Uh, these are very rare in soils anywhere uh, because they are so um, labile, uh, so easily uh, displaced uh, from um, the crystal lattice itself. So uh, mineral contacts give us an idea um, about um, the relative um, ability of a parent material to form a, a soil. Uh, so um, olivine and pyroxene and ultramafic rocks um, have difficulty getting into soils at all um, and they weather away rather quickly. Uh, they disappear. Uh, soils end up having mostly these sorts of materials. And then finally, chemical composition, which is just, um, a, I think, probably not quite as important um, as um, the mineralogy, the mineral structure. Uh, but uh, in general, um, what we have um, in soils are um, a bunch of elements that are stable. Those are Al, Si, Ti, uh, Zr, uh, zirconium, uh, which are stable. Uh, these uh, withstand weathering um, very readily um, and tend to accumulate in soils. Um, whereas these uh, cations, these alkali, alkaline earths and alkalis, um, soda and potassium, are very labile in uh, soils. And then um, in the middle ground, there's Fe, uh, iron and manganese, which are uh, moderately labile. Um, these um, 
we can get from a chemical analysis, a whole rock chemical analysis of a soil, um, and we'll give you an idea of um, parent material um, ability to withstand uh, withstand uh, weathering. If you have rocks that are already rich in these, um, then um, it's going to withstand weathering. Um, if you have rocks that are rich in these, it's going to weather uh, relatively uh, easily. So those are some general principles of parent material. Now let's, let's let me give you some more uh, concrete sorts of um, uh, examples of um, different kinds of parent materials and their effects uh, in um, making different kinds of uh, of soils. Some some common um, parent materials of soils. Um, loose and till are two uh, very uh, common um, parent materials of uh, soils um, and they are uh, quite widely uh, distributed um, through um, North America of course because we had this huge Cordilleran um, ice sheet. Um, uh, loose is a ground up um, salt sized material um, it's usually somewhat uh, calcareous. Uh, till is whatever the bedrock was. It can be calcareous if the bedrock was in um, in limestone, uh, but it also it, but it can be very quartz rich if the parent material um, was um, on a um, granite, for example, which is a very quartz rich rock. One of the nicest examples of um, how this determines soil formation is um, in um, New York. Where the bedrock um, in um, upstate New York is limestone, Devonian age limestone, uh, but in the Adirondack Mountains um, it is uh, it is granite, and then there's a layer uh, of on top of that of um, till and um, and loess. Uh, where the till is relative and loess is relatively calcareous, uh, we tend to get alpha sols. Um, in the deciduous forests of upstate New York, and I'm talking mainly about the Finger Lakes region of New York. Um, but in and around the Adirondacks um, and the Catskills, where there's a big source of um, quartz, we get mainly uh, spodosols. The distribution of uh, these uh, uh, the spodosols are generally um, on a conifer vegetation. So. Um, these are the deciduous forests of upstate New York. Um, we get up into the more calcareous and less nutrient rich. Um, the conifer forest is producing uh, spodosols. The parent material is um, determining uh, the kind of vegetation uh, that is there as well as the kind of soil that can potentially form um, in that kind of um, environment. Uh, marine rocks. One thing about marine rocks which is really um, interesting is that they, they tend to be fairly um, uniform. They tend to uh, create big thicknesses of uh, shale and they're often relatively calcareous because they're not deeply weathered after all. Um, the material is delivered into the ocean. The ocean is rich in cations and so um, we tend to get shale um, which has clays that are basically smectite. Uh, marine rocks will commonly produce vertisols. Um, the famous um, the vertisols are uh, the cracking clays uh, near New Braunfels in Texas um, and in the Darling Downs of, uh, of Australia. Um, these are primarily on uh, Cretaceous age marine rocks. The marine rock was fairly uniform, had a lot of clay to it. Um, they're in a seasonal climate, and so they tend to uh, they tend to produce a um, a, a, a vertisol. Um, limestones and dollar stones. Uh, 
um, are very thick. They tend to form these paleocasts, of course. Um, we'll do a dollar stone now just to show you how that's different. Uh, we use the slant pattern for dollar stone, of course. Um, and they form the same sort of paleocast, um, which is um, an fossil cave systems um, with blocks of material falling down in a very red uh, kind of a soil called a terra rosa um, or an orthent. A, um, an endosol which is formed um, on a bedrock uh, material. Um, this a process of weathering uh, this kind of a hard rock is so slow and so old that these materials uh, tend to be very rich in very stable clay minerals like gibbsite and um, bormite and uh, kaolinite. Um, deeply weathered materials uh, because these are, are forming over a relatively uh, long uh, period of time. Granitic rocks. Uh, granitic rocks have, of course, um, hornblende. That's one of the most easily weathered minerals. Uh, biotite. Um, but lots of feldspar of both sorts, um, well, three sorts, calcium, um, uh, soda, and um, potassium uh, feldspar, uh, and a lot of quartz. Uh, they tend to be fairly um, coarse-grained, and so they weather to a grus, which is a coarse aggregate. Even in desert climates, um, we find uh, these um, uh, granites uh, weathering uh, to a, uh, a grouse. Uh, they're also very um, quartz rich and sandy. Um, they uh, also tend to form spodosols under a uh, rather humid climate, a spodosol. They're very rich in quartz. They tend to be um, acidic. and uh, quartzose uh, soils. Uh, particularly in humid climates, um, they'll form a spodosol. In a desert climate, they'll form a, um, a grus, a um, kind of a loose kind of a um, collection of uh, grains that are uh, just basically uh, fallen apart. Basaltic rocks. Basaltic rocks are fine-grained, and so um, they're difficult to weather in that sense. Um, but what you have is pyroxene, olivine, feldspar, lots of plagioclase, not so much K-feldspar, um, um, a little bit of quartz, hardly any quartz. Uh, so um, given uh, that uh, kind of material, um, in, in humid climates, they tend to form clay soils that are alkaline, um, and they tend to form alpha soils. They're quite base rich. The clays are fairly base rich. Um, these minerals here disappear completely. Um, feldspar is also largely depleted. Um, there's not much quartz anyway. That's not a major player. Um, in any part of a soil developed on a um, on a basaltic uh, rock, and then finally there's volcanic ash. Uh, volcanic ash is a very interesting material uh, that has uh, these shards, glass shards. Um, with a volcanic explosion, what happens is bubbles come out of the lava. They exhale bubbles of uh, water vapor and CO2, and um, they expand, and the melt, uh, they're coming out of the molten lava within uh, the volcanic condu conduit. The bubbles expand to such an extent that they create these angular, glassy materials. They're 
um, created at about 1200 degrees centigrade in the event of the uh, volcano. When they hit the atmosphere at 25 degrees centigrade, they chill. They just chill to a glassy um, material. Um, and um, these uh, glassy materials then form layers of um, vitric tuff. Uh, vitric is just another word for glassy. Um, it's a very unusual parent material indeed. Um, and it's one, of course, um, which uh, creates um, andesols. We talked about these already. And disols is the um, USDA uh, name for them. Um, in the rest of the world, they're called andosols, which is the correct Japanese entomology. Um, these are sols that are very prized um, in tropical regions with volcanoes because they are so much more fertile than the other sols developed on the ancient um, granitic or metamorphic terrains, which are strongly depleted of elements and very difficult um, for plants to utilize. Uh, these andesols um, have a peculiar sort of weathering uh, which produces not clay, uh, but immogalite. Immogalite is an amorphous, non-crystalline weathering product. Uh, the first weathering product of uh, a glass is for the glass to just fall apart and lose its shape uh, and become a kind of a colloid, become a kind of a gel. Um, and that uh, gel is uh, what we call immogalite. It's not a mineral name. It's uh, basically a colloid. Um, with time, uh, the immogalite can crystallize as a smectite, but it takes a long time uh, for uh, these andesols to get to get actual clays. Immogalite is great for plants, not so great for soil structure. So these soils are kind of difficult to plow and um, and difficult to um, keep stable, especially on a slope but a very characteristic kind of a um, kind of a, uh, a parent material. Now, um, andesols are commonly recognized in um, the fossil record uh, by alteration products. Uh, for example, um, we have a whole bunch of andesols in the John Day Formation of Central Oregon. Um, and in the John Day Formation, um, we have um, these uh, have been altered to clinoptilolite. and selenite. Um, these minerals. This one is a zeolite, um, and this one is a uh, a clay mineral which is very rich in iron in the reduced state. This is a very green mineral. Um, and it's the main mineral that's used to make celadon ware, uh, which is a very elegant kind of greenish gray uh, Chinese uh, pottery. Clinoptilite is a kind of a zeolite. Both of these minerals are what we call late diagenetic minerals. They form at burial depths of about two to three uh, kilometers. And they form preferentially from um, amorphous materials like um, immogalite. So in the John Day formation, where we see these fantastic paleosols that have a very odd green color and a strange, really crystalline sheen to them, crystalline sheen from the clinoptilite, green color from the selenite. Um, those reflect ancient andesols which have been altered by burial alteration. We don't get any modern soils with these kind of green. Zeolites and selenite are not found in any modern soils at all, but we do have a lot of modern soils with, um, with, uh, with amogalite. A distinctive parent material forms a distinctive kind of soil, and then uh, with burial, that forms a very distinctive assemblage of um, a paleosol as well. Parent material is, is, is the very beginning of a chain of uh, forming soils, and then uh, paleosols that are uh, just really distinctive. So this week, um, we have lab six, uh, which is to uh, calculate um, the mass balance of uh, chemical alteration of a soil. Um, and it's a, um, it's a bit of math, but um, it's really um, a very important way of uh, estimating 
quantitatively um, the degree of uh, soil uh, formation. Um, I like to call it tau analysis. Um, because um, uh, it has uh, tau as one of its uh, variables. And one of the pioneers of it was George Brimhall. Actually, it's, uh, it goes way, way before George Brimhall. George Brimhall was um, um, a, um, an economic uh, geologist at the University of California um, in Berkeley. Uh, and economic geologists have always been very interested in uh, quantifying um, the reactions of materials um, altered by hydrothermal uh, solutions. They're very interested in ore generation. Um, and there are two uh, features of uh, cow analysis. One of them um, is to calculate epsilon, which is the strain. Um, there's a formula for this which I won't put up. It's in the it's in the guide, and you can find it fairly easily. The strain is the degree to which the soil gained or lost its volume. Lost its volume. So what happens when you weather a parent material is things are dissolved and washed away, and the whole thing starts to lose its volume. We also want to know um, the degree to which it gained or lost um, a, uh, a component. And that's what we call mass transfer. There are two aspects of um, this uh, calculation. Um, one of them is to try and calculate the strain. And the other is to calculate the mass, uh, the loss, and um, the uh, gain of a particular uh, compound. Now, um, we want to calculate both the strain and the mass transfer for various levels within the soil profile with respect to um, the parent material. So you have to find a parent material. Um, now, uh, if you have a granite, for example, uh, you can go down to the base of the profile and find the cleanest piece of granite that is there. And by cleanest, I mean the one with no clay or weathering rinds or any indication of rotten minerals. Uh, that have been that have been weathered in thin section. That's really obvious. Um, a very clean granite, for example, um, will show nice crystal junctions that are not um, uh, filled with clay or other weathering products um, in between. Um, we need to try and deal with apparent uniformity. Um, all the stuff I went on about at the beginning. Uh, do we see um, any disruptions um, in? the um, nature of the material that suggests that we've got different parent materials in there that are mixed in in, 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 in layers. We need to select a stable constituent. Now, we need the stable constituent for the strain. So this analysis assumes that the stable constituent stayed there. It didn't move around. And so if you have a situation where the stable constituent is um, increasing with uh, abundance from the bottom to the top of the profile, that means the profile lost volume. It had a negative strain. If, on the other hand, you have a stable constituent that is um, declining in abundance up and down the profile uh, with these assumptions, um, that means that the um, profile gained volume. Um, and maybe the profile wasn't a paleocell at all. Maybe it was a, um, uh, maybe it was a sediment. Um, the, um, we can use AL203. 
uh, which is good in soils that have a pH of about 5 to 9. Uh, we can use TiO2, uh, which is also good uh, in this pH range. We can use silica, as long as the pH is less than about 9 in the soil. Um, this is the one I generally use, TiO2. You can also use zirconium, but that takes a special um, an analysis. Um, zirconium is very stable. Um, uh, it's primarily in a mineral called zircon, um, and it's a very stable and uh, very weathered uh, material. Now, um, in fact, all of them do move around a little bit, but if we make the assumption uh, that uh, something is um, a stable constituent, um, then we can start to calculate the strain. Uh, we can also um, calculate independently the mass uh, transfer. The general way in which this is done uh, is in a diagram which is like this, um, so that we have um, the parent material in the middle. This is epsilon, this is tau, this is minus 1, plus 1, minus 1, plus 1. So um, we can use uh, formulae, and I won't, I won't put them up. Um, uh, you can uh, enter them in your spreadsheet, uh, and uh, you, can, uh, you can look that up um, to calculate the degree to which the soil itself is changing its volume or strain. A well-behaved soil should go something like this. So what's happening? Uh, this is the A horizon. This is the um, R horizon, the parent material. The A horizon is more altered. It lost more mass than the BT horizon or the C horizon. That's a well-organized um, uh, uh, soil. Uh, let's say this is tau for, we can do tau for calcium, uh, magnesium, um, sodium, and potassium. They all should look like this in a well-behaved uh, soil because um, increased weathering of the surface compared to the base is going, you're going to lose more of these um, as, you go, as you go down. Uh, and the whole soil itself is losing volume uh, with respect to titanium or uh, zircon. Zirconium, um, the um, the deviation from here, and it's in we, we calculate it in a mole fraction, so we do it on a mole base, a molar basis. A, a mole of each of these elements is um, is compared with a mole loss of or gain of uh, titanium. So that's the soil. What if you start to get pots that are up here? Well, that's going to be a sediment. Because you're gaining volume and you're gaining materials. Um, and if you do a soil or sediment pair, um, you're going to see um, that they complement each other. Uh, because after all, these materials are being weathered out of the soil and they're ending up in the ocean or a lake anyway, in solution, um, a lot of them. Um, the sediment gains them. Um, it's a very elegant way of um, looking at the degree of uh, soil uh, formation. Um, you can end up getting um, samples that are out here too. Um, uh, in <coughs> sprotosols, for example, you're going to have um, iron <coughs> in a spotic horizon. It's going to be enriched even though the profile itself lost volume. Um, if you have a bog iron or, or a banded iron formation, uh, the iron is going to be enriched out here as a part of a sedimentary um, process. Um, this tau analysis, uh, this um, looking at the degree to which the soil has changed from its parent material is a very, very powerful way of quantifying uh, soil uh, formation. Now you can do this in a with a modern soil. Um, there's one more feature that we need to uh, consider when we're dealing with paleosols and that is compaction. So the profile has formed uh, somewhat, um, and it has lost volume as it's formed. 
But also, uh, what's happened is that the profile has been squeezed. With burial compaction, the profile can be squeezed up to, um, well, 60 to 70 percent of its original volume is pretty, is pretty, uh, is pretty normal. Uh, one way we can figure out compaction is by looking at um, the um, deformation of plastic dikes. So um, in original soil, um, a straight crack uh, which was filled with sand, um, if it's compacted, it's going to be um, tigmatically folded. And if you measure this distance around all the bends and compare it with this distance, um, you can get a compaction factor. Uh, one I've illustrated uh, from experience is about 60%. So it's been compacted to about 60% of its volume. Um, we can, if we have this in a soil, calculate what the compaction is. We also have equations, and I won't put those up either, uh, that can um, decompact the soil. Uh, we know, for example, from the oil companies, uh, they're very, very interested um, in um, the um, uh, compaction of uh, rocks, and we have uh, some engineering equations that we can use to decompact the soil. Uh, so we can decompact it, we can take a paleosol, we can decompact it, we can run it through tau analysis, um, and the, the compaction does affect um, some of these um, analyses. Uh, the bottom line is we can um, get a very accurate assessment of the degree of soil formation that's happened, and it all goes back to picking accurately uh, the parent. If you pick the wrong parent, um, then of course uh, that's the assumption on which the whole edifice rests, and um, it's in trouble. Um, this kind of approach has been very, very helpful for a variety of reasons, um, and um, it's also a very good way to tell whether something is a paleosol or is a sedimentary bed. Paleosols, this is in the um, in the lost volume, lost material um, uh, field, or whether it is a sediment generally in the gained volume, gained material um, field. Um, when people argue about whether something's a paleosol or not, well, do one of these. Um, and you start to see uh, pretty clear answers emerge. Well, that'll do it for today. Uh, thanks for your attention.